Well, we are studying 1 John chapter 3, and we never want to enter the Word of God without prayer. So let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for who you are, and we thank you for going to such extremes on our behalf. We thank you for your Word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We do pray, Father, that you would open our hearts and lives to your Word that you help each of us become more effective stewards of the opportunities before us as we commit this hour and ourselves into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord, our Savior, our coming King. Amen. Okay, we're in session 6 of 8, and we're exploring 1 John chapter 3. And uh, this is about pretenders. 1 John 3 is all about counterfeit Christians. In fact, in verse 10, he's going to call them the children of the devil. Wow. Now, the true child of God practices righteousness, loves other Christians despite their differences. That may come as a shock to some of our friends, okay? 1 John 3, the first 10 verses, deals with the first group the true child of God that practices righteousness, right? The second part of this chapter deals with the second group here, those that love other Christians despite their differences. Chapter 4 will really deal with false teachers. We'll defer some of that. But the first is not a new theme. First, first John chapter 1 and 2 dealt with these. But in 1 John 3, the, the whole approach is going to be a little different. In the earlier chapters, the focus was on fellowship. Chapters 1 and 2. But in 1 John 3, 1 to 5, the emphasis is on sonship. The whole epistle is a family matter. Most epistles are church epistles. This one's a little different. This is more intimate. This is a family epistle. But the first couple of chapters were on fellowship. This chapter will be on sonship, our, our position in the family, right? born of God, the barren ones. We ran into that earlier. And the, you, you can see this thread all the way through, of course. There are three reasons for a holy life. God the Father loves us. That's one of the three reasons. The first three verses will focus on that. God the Son died for us. That's the next few verses. And God the Holy Spirit lives in us. And that's the next few verses. So those are the three key reasons. Interestingly, isomorphic, if you will, with the Godhead. The first group is that the Father loves us. So let's take a look at it. 1 John 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Now why are we surprised that we get treated so poorly sometimes? Remember how they treated our king. Now, this can be translated, Behold, what peculiar, out-of-this-world kind of love the Father has bestowed upon us. And while we were His enemies, God loved us and sent His Son to die for us. That's staggering. As you, as you see the movie The Passion, you get a glimpse, perhaps, of, of the Passion of Christ. But the thing you can't capture even in a movie would be the Passion of the Father. Can you imagine a father loving you that much that he would allow his son to be insulted, spit upon, and torn in pieces, and, and, and killed, executed? Wow. Many translators add a phrase to 1 John 3, 1, that we should be called the sons of God, and we are. <laughs> and uh, they can infer that from the Greek, but I won't get into all that. Sons of God. That's a term that has very specific, uh, pre precise meaning in the Scripture. And uh, the, the, it's not simply a high-sounding phrase. It's a very critical reality. You won't understand Genesis chapter 6 and the flood of Noah unless you understand what the Benai Elohim, the sons of God phrase means. It refers to a direct creation of God. That term, that Hebrew term in the Old Testament is always used of angels because they were a direct creation of God. They were created even before the earth was. Okay? So that's the, 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 they were angels that are, are part of the, the thing there. In fact, when you get to the Gospel of, of uh, John, chapter 1, verse 11, 
He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. The term there is used. Why? Because it's a new creation. You and I are not sons of God in the natural. We're sons of Adam. We're sons of Adam. Adam was a direct creation of God. His offspring were sons of Adam. And that's where we are Adam, in our Adamic nature. When we accept Christ, there is a new creation. He never, he never heals a broke, uh, uh, heart. He replaces it. Our, our, our heart is incurably wicked, Jeremiah tells us. No, it's a, it's so the, the point is there's a new creation. That's why this born again is not just a phrase. It's a theological reality. The sons of God is a term. Here, it, it's fairly rare in its New Testament emphasis. But here's one of the places. And, of course, in John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, is another place um, that it's really drawing what, what some scholars call an Old Testament idiom, if you will. But we should not expect the world to understand this thrilling relationship we enjoy because they, they don't understand God, let alone this relationship. Only a person who knows God through Christ can fully appreciate what it means to be called a child of God. Don't get caught up in the brotherhood of man thing. That's humanism. You watch out for that. Be careful of that kind of, of labeling. But here's, people ask me, what's one of your favorite verses in the Bible? And there's not just a few of these, there's a handful, but this is among them. We're going to spend a little time on verse 2. Don't panic. We're not going to spend that much time on each of the verses in this chapter. But I love verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse, the, the first verse told us what we are. Verse 2 tells us what we shall be. What on earth is that? Are we there yet? Not quite. But what will we be? Now this was mentioned back in chapter 2 uh, as an incentive for holy living, but now it's going to be elaborated on. Now you cannot understand this verse without a mathematical physics background. So are you ready? <laughs> and I'm exaggerating just a little bit, of course. That when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This remarkable statement requires an understanding of hyperspaces. Space, what's that? That's a fancy word for spaces of more than three dimensions. Okay? So let's back up and review some stuff that you probably remember from our Learn the Bible in 24 hour summary. Stretching the heavens, the fabric of space. We think of space as an empty vacuum that's very naive and uninformed. The scripture says, speaks of God who alone stretches out the heavens. Is that just a metaphor? Stretching out heaven like a tent curtain. Stretching out heavens like a curtain spreads out like a tent to dwell in. Isaiah 40. He has stretched out the heavens in Jeremiah 10. The Lord who stretched... This phrase occurs throughout the scripture. Is it just a poetical phrase? Or is it an insight into physics that will baffle our scientists even to this day? Okay. I could go on and on, as you can imagine, that this stretching the heavens is all through the scripture. Space, first of all, we know today is not an empty vacuum. Any of you radio hands? Any radio hands here? You know that space has an impedance. You've got to match for an antenna and so forth. No. Space can be torn, Isaiah tells us. It can be worn out like a garment in Psalm 102. Space can be shaken, really. Hebrews, Haggai, and Isaiah all make that uh, expression. Space can be burnt up, Peter warns us. You want to talk about global warming, Peter has a verse on that for you. It can split apart like a scroll in Revelation 6. Is that just a figure of speech? It can be rolled up like a mantle or a scroll in Hebrews and Isaiah. Now that gives us a clue here to think through a little bit. What do you mean rolled up? There must be some dimension in which space must be thin in order to be rolled, right? Space can be bent, we're told. Well, if that's the case, there must be a direction in which it can be bent toward. See, those words carry some insights here. So this all implies there must be an additional spatial dimension than the ones that we directly experience in order for it to have those properties. 
Well, we see Paul tells us that in Ephesians. Many people miss this in Ephesians 3, verse 17 and 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ and so on. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What, did you pick up on that? How many are there? Four. Four dimensions. Really? How did Paul know? Was he a physicist? I don't think so. Or is this one of these little fingerprints of the Holy Spirit editing the text for us? Be able to comprehend the breadth, okay, the platos in the Greek, suggesting great extent that can be time as well as space. Length, the, the mikos, the length. And depth, uh, bathos. And height, the uh, hupsos. So, but the main point is there are four of these things. That's kind of interesting. Four-dimensional space. That's a big discovery of 20th century science. They should have checked with Paul a long time ago. But we're going to talk about hyperdimensions. These are dimensions, that's a term that mathematicians would use, of spaces more than th with more than three dimensions. We are in a hyperspace. We know we have four here, right? We're just, we've just moved beyond Euclid. In school, you learned what was called Euclidean geometry. That's uh, something that uh, uh, is three, or three dimensions. In 1854, George Riemann gave the most important mathematical lecture in history. On June 10th of that year, he introduced metric tensors. It took 60 years for them to be applied practically, and that's what Einstein used to develop his four-dimensional space-time that we know as the theory of relativity. And then uh, he, he, Einstein went to his death frustrated because he couldn't reconcile certain aspects of physics, but 60 years later, doing exactly what I, see, Einstein realized that space couldn't be three-dimensional. So he added, by going one more dimension, to solve his problem. If he'd taken that same methodology a little further, as Kaluza Klein did in the, 50, in the 50s, to reconcile light and supergravity, he, would have, he wouldn't have gone to his death so frustrated. And in 1963, Yang Mills took it even further, reconciling electromagnetic and both the nuclear forces, both weak and strong nuclear forces. And the current theory, in 19, from 1984 on, is that we have not four, Ten dimensions and uh, uh, super strings, and there's all kinds of variations of that. But what's interesting, if you do your historical homework, you'll discover that a, a Hebrew sage by the name of Nachmanides, he wrote in the 13th century, he concluded from his study of the book of Genesis that it has ten dimensions and that only four are knowable. And he published that in 1263. Now, why am I making reference to this? Well, the great discovery of particle physicists in the 20th century using atomic accelerators is that they've discovered that we, have, we live in 10 dimensions. Four of them are directly measurable, three spatial dimensions and time. Six of them are curled in less than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, smaller than a wavelength of light, thus are inferable only by indirect means, but we can confirm their, their, their uh, existence by those indirect means. So they, by spending millions of dollars on atomic accelerators, we've learned what Nachmanides did by doing his homework in the book of Genesis. But there's a, I want to talk a little bit about hyperspaces just to give you a flavor of this. But there are only two kinds of people seem to be able to deal with hyperspace. And that's, of course, mathematicians with special training and small children. Okay? They have no trouble with this at all. But we, instead of trying to take you to four and five dimensions without elaborate props and things, we can gain a lot of insight by going in the other direction, imagining a world with only two dimensions. And we're indebted to Edwin Abbott back in 1906 who developed this approach to understanding. I, want to I was going to introduce you to two, two of my friends. The two friends I want to introduce you to, before I introduce them to you, I want you to have compassion because they suffer from a very serious handicap because they live in only two dimensions. And it's Mr. and Mrs. Flat. And I want you to imagine them in a two-dimensional world, okay? Now let's assume that we have two pieces of that two-dimensional world. Mrs. Flat, there's no way she can imagine getting to Mr. Flat in her world because she li lives only in two dimensions. But if I come along as a three-dimensional being, I can pick her up and put her in the other one and from her point of view, a miracle's taken place. She has no ability to, uh, no capacity to imagine a third dimension. She only knows two dimensions. Got the picture? So you got an insight. What other insights might we get? 
Well, first of all, they, I, I can put my finger one millionth of an inch away from each of them, no matter where they are. My proximity to them is totally independent of the distance between them. Why? Because I have another dimensionality. Wow. So we're getting some insights here, perhaps, huh? If I, as a three-dimensional being, poke my finger through their two-dimensional universe, what do they see? A dot that becomes a circle and then it disappears, right? Putting another way, if a ball passes through, what is it? It's a dot, becomes a circle. In other words, they only perceive that which is discernible within their own dimensionality. Now, let's now shift to a three-dimensional world. We're a group of disciples in an upper room. The room has a floor, a ceiling, and four walls. It's a six-sided figure, right? Floor, ceiling, four walls. All the doors and windows are locked. And we get a visitor who shows up. Well, he's a spirit. No, he isn't. He challenges that. Handle me and see. A spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see me have. And yet, so he's tangible, palpable. And yet, he can enter and leave a six-sided space without penetrating any of the six sides. See, he's hyperdimensional. Now, see, we, need, we do well to get a little bit of perspective of what we call reality. And I'll represent us by the Vitruvian man of uh, Da Vinci, just idiomatically here. And I want to talk about size. Larger than us or smaller than us? Larger going to the right, smaller going to the left here, okay? In terms of largeness, see, there's, we discovered there's, an elusive, there's a concept of mathematics that we cannot find physically. That's infinity. On the large size, we discover that in the sense of largeness, the universe is finite. The great discovery of 20th century science is that our, from astronomy and physics and so forth, that our universe is not infinite. It's very big and may be expanding, but it's finite. That's staggering its implication. That's why it had a beginning, and that gives rise to the conjectures called Big Bang theories and what have you. Okay, that is something we can sort of deal with. Let's go the other way. Let's talk, let's talk about smallness. If we go to smallness here, that's the field of quantum physics, subatomic particles. And we discover something very disturbing that there's a limit to smallness, that length, mass, energy, and time are made up of indivisible units called quanta. If you split one of those, it loses locality. It's suddenly everywhere at one time. What's that mean? Well, turn to, let's talk a little bit about that. You've all seen the little model of an atom in your, in your books. You have a nucleus, and you have an electron spinning. That's one way to represent it, of course. We call it a nucleus, and we have an electron. Take the simplest atom we know, a hydrogen atom, right? We're together so far. This is obviously not the scale. We know that the atom is about 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. Point zero 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 eight zeros, you know, one centimeter. Nucleus is even much, much uh, smaller than that. The ratio of the atom to its nucleus is one part, uh, uh, I'll put it the other way around is that the nucleus is one part in 10 to the fifth. What does all that mean? Well, the if, you made the, if you want to make a model of this and you make, use a golf ball for the nucleus, the electron will be three miles away. So if you're going to build one of these in your garage, you better, you got a problem, okay? Just a model of it. The point I want you to get across is that the ratio of the, the size of the golf ball to the total is one part in 100,000. We're together so far? Just broad terms here? Okay. But that ratio is a linear relationship, right? To get an area, you have to square it. To get a volume, you have to cube it. So the volumetric ratio of this atom is 10 to the 5th cubed, or saying it another way, 10 to the 15th. Let me... Let me uh, point out that that ratio is the same ratio as one second has to 30 million years. We're dealing with, that's why scientists use these exponential, that's a way of representing very large numbers. I'm, ra I'm, I'm creating a, a this, the ratio of the nucleus to the atom 
is the same ratio as one second has to 30 million years. What does that mean? I have a, pl a podius up here. You say, that's solid, okay? And I say, this is solid. And Gary says, no, it isn't. It doesn't even exist there. Is it, is it, it's all empty space. He is more correct than I am by the same ratio. It's more like empty space than it is solid by a ratio of one second to 30 million years. It's empty. It's an illusion. In fact, it's an electrical simulation. Really. So let's, go, let's talk about this another way. If I take a, a, a line, I can cut that in half, right? No problem. I can take the half of that and I can cut it in half, right? Now you would think I could do that forever. Take the half and, and, and so forth. Go smaller and smaller. You think I could do that at least conceptually forever. No, it turns out I can't. When I get down to 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and attempt to cut that in half, it loses a property called by physicists locality. We now discover and have proven in the laboratory that every photon in the universe knows exactly what every other photon is exhibiting. They're linked in a strange way. And that's, that, le that leads to this, uh, that, that they lose locality. There's a Planck length of 33 centimeters, a Planck time and 10 to the minus 43 seconds. I think that's what a twinkle of an eye is, by the way. Not a blink, a twinkle. Anyway, uh, it's the speed of light going through that small... Anyway, so if we take this thing, what we've said, on the large size, we know we have finite, finiteness. On the small size, we have finiteness. In other words, there's nothing infinitely small and nothing infinitely large. We're, we find ourselves in a reality that is simulated. It isn't a real reality. And uh, at the, now, if you, uh, we are in a digital simulation. And that discovery is very disturbing. In the Scientific American, in June of 2005, they had an article which concludes that our universe is but a shadow of a larger reality. That's their words, not mine. But that's exactly what the Bible has been saying all along. Now, a photograph is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object. If I give you a picture of Gary, you'll recognize him in the picture, but it's still a representation, a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object. You say, well, I can get a hologram. That's like a window into, into a three-dimensional space. Well, we're getting somewhere here. In holography, we take a piece of photograph, we illuminate the photograph with a laser, and we take a reference beam and reflect it off that and record the way those two beams interfere. And what we gain on that thing is a is the collection of the interference patterns of the direct light and the reflected light. And when you look at it in, in regular light, it looks like a darkroom mistake. It's a foggy piece of film. When you illuminate it with the laser that created it, it becomes a window, a three-dimensional. It's actually a Fourier transform of that image. And it's like a window in, uh, 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 in through space. And depending what you, which way you look at it, you're looking into a three-dimensional space. But even that, even a hologram, is a, th is a, representa three -dimension, a representation of a three-dimensional space. But now let's go, having all that palaver behind you, let's take a look at 1 John 3, 2 one more time carefully. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He, who's that He? Jesus. When He shall appear, we shall be like Him. How do we know that? Before, because we will see Him as He is. Now, we don't know how many dimensions Jesus enjoys right now. We know that it's more than 11, because that's the only way He could mathematically get in and out of a six-sided sphere. That's a lot of, that's, that's just a property that he apparent, he has at least that, maybe much more. But here's the point. Whatever he enjoys, we will be like him. Why? Because we're going to see him as he is. We're not going to see a three-dimensional representation of a four-dimensional object. We're not going to see a ten-dimensional representation of an 11-dimensional object. No, whatever, whatever we're, he enjoys, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're going to apparently enjoy the same dimensionality. Wow is right. 
And that's uh, what uh, Paul says in uh, Romans, the redemption of our body, the glorification. We have no grasp of what that all means, but we're getting a glimpse of it here through John's epistle. That when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Wow. Okay, moving on. Every man that hath this hope in him does what? Coasts, puts his feet on the desk and says, enough. no, no, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. This is a call to holy living. The apostle is not there. He tells us that what we should be, in view of his imminent return, we should keep ourselves clean. Remember the Christian's bar of soap, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We stay clean by applying that. All this is to remind us of the Father's love. He wants us to live with Him every day. Salvation from start to finish is an expression of the love of God. The cross, absolutely. The resurrection, validating it all and opening the door to a, a, a future we have probably no ability to fully comprehend. An unbeliever who sins is a creature sinning against his Creator. A Christian who sins is a child sinning against his Father. Do children do that? Yes. Not with impunity. Okay, so that's the first three verses. Let's move to the next few. God the Son died for us. That's the reason we look for a holy life. Whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And we know that He was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him is no sin. Manifest. We're talking about here, it now turns from, uh, from the future appearing of the Lord Jesus to His past appearing. He's looking back here. Manifest means meaning to appear. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. And John gives us two reasons why Jesus came and died. To take away our sins and to destroy the works of the devil. He's going to talk about that forthcoming here, the next group of things. A child, for a God, child of God to sin indicates that he does not understand or appreciate what Jesus did for him on the cross. We'll talk more about that before we're through here. Every great personality of the Bible has sinned one time or another. Abraham lied about his wife twice. Moses lost his temper and disobeyed God. Didn't inherit. By the way, can you lose your inheritance? Yes, you can. Can't lose your salvation. can lose your inheritance. Ask Reuben about that. Ask Esau about that. Ask Moses about that. He didn't, after 120 years, he, did, he blew it too. But he's got another chance in Revelation 11, I think. Anyway. David had his affair with Bathsheba and, of course, even resorted to murder. We all know the story. Poor David. Throughout eternity, everybody is going to know his story. Right? <laughs> Peter denied the Lord three times. All right. But sin was not settled in the lives of these men. It was an incident in their lives, totally contrary to their normal lives, totally contrary to their normal habits. When they sinned, they admitted it, repented of it, and ask God to forgive them. The unsaved person, even if he professes to be a Christian but is, un is a counterfeit, lives a life of habitual sin, especially the sin of unbelief. It is the normal thing in his life. In other words, it's characteristic of him. It's not an incident. It's characteristic. Ephesians talks about this. Ephesians chapter 2, first three verses. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our behavior. The word conversation in those days meant, you know, is what we've used the term behavior. In times past, in the lust of your flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Ooh. See, the unbeliever has no divine resources to draw upon. His profession of faith is not real. This is the distinction that is in view here in the first ten verses of this chapter. A true believer does not live in a habitual sin. He may commit sin, an occasional wrong act, but he will not practice sin. That is, means making a habit of it. The difference is that a true Christian knows God. A counterfeit Christian may talk about God and get involved in religious activities, but he does not really know God. A true Christian lives a life of obedience. He does not practice sin. And Christ appeared in order to take away all our sins. Now, biblical definitions of sin, boy, this is a big subject. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin, Romans tells us. 
The thought of foolishness is sin. Boy, am I guilty. In a lot of ways, actually. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin, James 4. All unrighteousness is sin, 1 John 5. But here, John defines sin simply as lawlessness. The emphasis not on sins, plural, but on sin, singular. Sins are fruit. Sin is the root. Different use of the term, if you will. The, 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 the singular, and this is one of those, this is a synecdoche, where the singular is the general for the whole category. God's love does not mean he does no, has no rules or regulations for his family. That's not the law. It's a different issue altogether here. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. First John 2. That was last time. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. And he's going to hit that in our fifth chapter when we get to it. God's children are not in bondage to the Old Testament law, for Christ has made us free and has given us liberty. Sin is basically a matter of the will. For us to assert our will against God's will is rebellion, and rebellion is the root of sin. The very essence of sin is lawlessness. The whole work of the cross is denied when a professed Christian practiced deliberate sin. This is one reason why Paul calls such people the enemies of the cross of Christ. Philippians 3. Ooh. Little children, there's a technia term, that, that, that it, term of endearment. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God is, was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now we've got a little interesting problem here. The word destroy is maybe a little misleading. Destroy does not mean annihilate. Satan is certainly still at work today. Destroy here means to render inoperative, to rob of power. A little different tone, but it's important. Jesus compares this world to a palace that contains many valuable goods. A strong man is guarding the place. That's his idioms in Luke 11. Every time a lost sinner is won to Christ, more of Satan's spoils are taken from him, in effect. Here's the idiom. Christ appeared in order to destroy the works of the devil. If a man knows God, he will obey God. If he belongs to the devil, he will obey the devil. John accepts the reality of a personal devil here. Many different names are used in Scripture. Satan, of course, means adversary. Devil means accuser. Abaddon or Polyon means destroyer. Prince of this world. Dragon, the red dragon, Revelation 12, etc. What's his chief activity? To oppose Christ and God's people. Satan is not eternal. Satan is a rebel. Christ is the obedient Son of God, even to the death of the cross. Christ is God, but was willing to become a servant. Satan was a servant who wanted to become God. Christ was born of a woman so that you and I could be born again. He humbled himself so that we could be lifted up. He became a servant so that we could be made joint heirs with him. We have no capacity to imagine what that means. He suffered rejection so that we could become his friends. He denied himself so that we could freely receive all things. He gave himself so that he could bless us in every way. Wow. Can't get over that. Okay. And the, the other reason we have a holy life is that the Holy Spirit lives in us. Wow. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. For he cannot sin because he is born of God. His seed remaineth in him. No one of born of God practices sin. He cannot practice sin because he is born of God. Why? Because he has a new nature within him. It's that new nature that he's talking about here. A new nature cannot sin. John calls this new nature God's seed. The child of God is given a new nature, and that new nature does not and will not commit sin. The reason that the prodigal son could not stay in the pig pen was that he was not a pig. Okay? He was the son of the father, and he belonged in the father's house. If you are a child of God, you will want to be in the father's house, and you will long for it. Abide is one of John's favorite words. It is this abiding, communion. Koinonia is the Greek term that keeps us from deliberately disobeying God's word. There's more in the death of Christ on the cross than simply our salvation from judgment. 
as wonderful as that is, through his death, Christ broke the power of, this, of the sin principle in our lives. Romans 6 to 8, those chapters 6 through 8, is the, this identification with Christ in his death and resurrection. Christ not only died for me, I died with Christ. Now I can yield myself to him and sin will not have dominion over me. And that's what we're talking about. There are three tenses of being saved. Have been saved, past tense, the, from the penalty of sin. That's positional. It's called justification. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 deals with that. You are being saved, present tense. That's from the power of sin, operationally, by the Holy Spirit, moment by moment. It's called sanctification. Romans 6 shall be saved, that's future tense, from the presence of sin, called the redemption of our body. Wow. Well, we talked about that earlier. Okay. When a person receives Christ as a Savior, tremendous spiritual changes take place in him. He is given a new standing before God, being accepted as righteous in God's sight. This new standing is called justification. It, will, it never expires and is never lost. The new Christian is also given a new position He's set apart for God's own purposes to live for His glory. This new position is called sanctification. That's what sanctify means, to be set apart. And it has a way of changing from day to day. You should be growing. There should be some improvement. You have two natures in you then. You can't cast out flesh. It's still there. You have two natures. Which one are you feeding the most? Oh. Did you, have to, did you know you have a spiritual hygiene as well as a physical hygiene? Physical man needs cleansing. So does the inner man. That's, remember the Christian's bar of soap when we talk about 1 John 1.9? Uh, Unconfessed sins are the first step in what the Bible calls backsliding. Sin is like a virus. Instead of fighting in its invasion, we yield to it. Carried away, enticed, bait and hooked, trapped. The end is death, of course. James 1 deals with that. The inner man also needs food and cleansing. The inner man does. He also needs exercise. That includes exercising, not defrauding the body of Christ with your spiritual gift. If you have a spiritual gift and aren't exercising it, you are defrauding the body. Whew. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteous is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So yielding to sin is the distinguishing mark of a child of the devil. They profess or claim one thing, but practice uh, another. Satan is a liar and the father of lies. We're going to see John 8, 44 referred to a number of times as we go proceed through this. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. False teachers in John's day taught that a Christian did not have to worry about sin because only the body sinned, and what the body did in no way affected the spirit. Weird ideas. Some of them went so far as to teach that sin is natural to the body because of the body of sinful. The New Testament exposes the foolishness of such excuses for sin. The old nature is not the body. The body itself is neutral. It can be used either by the old sinful nature or by the new divine nature. How does a child of God go about overcoming the desire of the old sin nature? By beginning each day, yielding his body to God as a living sacrifice. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 is your keywords. Are your, are your keywords. And uh, if you want to understand how to do that in practical terms, I encourage you to take a look at my wife's book called Be Ye Transformed. wrote a whole book on Romans 12, 1 and 2, the practical uh, techniques to really do that. And she does. Thy word have I hidden my heart, the psalmist says, that I might not sin against thee. Scripture memory has a place in your spiritual hygiene. People say, Chuck, why do you use the King James? Well, for a number of reasons. Everyone has their problems. The King James are well-known, well-documented. But I do it for another reason everybody overlooks. When I do my memory work, I want to do it in a, ver in a version that's going to be around 20 years from now. These others come and go. I'm on the review committee for the International Standard Version Bible. And it's pretty, I'm getting quite impressed with it. And we may start using that in many things. But I'm glad that my memory work for the last 60 years has been in the King James, because it's still here. I'm glad I didn't get picked up on the RSV back then. Anyway, okay. If he does sin, he must instantly confess to God and claim forgiveness, but it's not necessary, it is not necessary for him to sin. There hath no temptation 
taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You ought to add that to your memory group. That's a great one. That's a great comfort, a great reminder. That's your escape clause when you're under pressures. The true Christian also loves other Christians. Oh boy, I knew that was a tough one here. Right? These words are not written that you and I might check on other people. They were given so that we might examine ourselves. Oh, do I have the divine nature within me or am I merely pretending to be a Christian? These are little self-test questions to think about. Do I cultivate this divine nature by daily Bible reading and prayer? Do you? Think about it. Has any unconfessed sin defiled my inner man? Is a question we should ask every morning. Am I willing to confess and forsake it? Oh, there's the rub. I mean, I've got to quit. Oh. Do I allow my old nature to control my thoughts and desires, or does the divine nature rule me? That's the ultimate issue, isn't it? When temptation comes, do I play with it, or do I flee from it? The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, your response is faith. The devil, you fight. You have authority. Your flesh, you flee. Faith, Fight, flee. Different strategy for each of those challenges. Do I immediately yield to the divine nature within me? The life that is real is honest with God about these vital issues. We're going to explore four levels of relationship. Murder, ooh, hatred, indifference, and Christian compassion. We'll wrap this up. I'm reminded by Ruth Graham. Somebody asked her apparently, that if in their married life, if there was ever an issue of adultery. She says, adultery, no. Murder, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. The unbeliever sins against the law. The believer sins against love. <whistles> Let's think about that a minute. The unbeliever is sinning against the law, and he has the law within himself. We're told. It doesn't have to be a Jew to sin against the law. Even a Gentile can because it's in his heart. The believer sins against what? Love. Boy, that's wild. What held Jesus to that cross? It wasn't the nails. He created the... He was crucified on a cross of wood, yet he made the heel on which it stood. He could have said, enough already, I'm out of here. What held him to that cross was his love for us. And our response to that should be to love him enough clean up our act. Not as Cain, John tells us, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Read that envy. Murder is the lowest level, is the level on which Satan himself exists, according to John 8.44. Cain is also an example. And he's not presented as an atheist, by the way. He's presented as a worshiper. Wow. Think about that a minute. The children of the devil masquerade as true believers. They attend religious gatherings. They even bring offerings. These are not valid proofs that, they are, that that person is born of God. It seems clear that God had given definite instructions concerning how he was to be worshipped. Cain decided to do his own way. That's what, that was the significance of God covering them with coats of skins to teach them that by the shedding of innocent blood they would be covered. There was a procedure instituted in Eden. Cain decided to do it his own way, providing his own works. Satan is always interested in turning people away from the revealed will of God. The real test of his love for the brethren, here Cain failed. He murdered his brother and then lied about it. His envy turned to anger, and centuries later, Pharisees did the same thing to Jesus. And Jesus here too called them the children of the devil in John 8, 44. So John says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you, the world hates Christ for the same reason Cain hated Abel. Christ reveals the world's sin and its true nature. Then they must either repent or destroy the messenger. Wow. Satan is the prince of this world and controls it through murder and lies. Like Cain, the people of the world try to cover up their true nature 
with religious life. Religion is man's attempt to cover himself. Man's attempt to find God. No. God deals with it from his side. In contrast to this, God is love, according to John 4, 8, and truth, according to John, the Gospel of John 4, uh, 14, and 1 John 5. We're going to get to those subsequently. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. To a Christian, hatred is the same as murder. And Matthew says the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know, him, ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Lust is the same as adultery also, by the way. These equivalences are part of the Sermon on the Mount. Very disturbing stuff. Now don't, under, don't misunderstand this. We're not being told that murderers cannot be saved. Paul took a hand in the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7. And he admitted that his vote helped put innocent people to death in Acts 26 elsewhere. God's grace saved him. The issue is not whether one continue. The issue is whether one can continue to be a murderer. The answer is no. Hatred does the hater more damage than it does anyone else. It actually puts one into a spiritual and emotional prison. The reason you want to forgive people is to free yourself. Get, get out of bondage. The antidote, of course, is love. Hereby perceive we the love of God because He laid down His life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Failure to, to do evil. Failure to do evil is not enough. Love involves doing them some good. Isaiah 1. And James said a lot about that too. Jesus did, didn't just talk about His love. He died to prove it. And He was not a martyr. He willingly laid down His life. Interesting dis, dis, uh, discernment there, isn't it? Self-preservation is the first law of physical life. Self-sacrifice is the first law of spiritual life. They're antithetical. Whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? See, John turns from the brethren in verse 16 to the singular and specific his brother in verse 17. One of the things you want to know about the NIV, the Nearly Inspired Version, 3,000 places they change the singular to plural to avoid countability. Here's an example of something where it's a shifting from brethren to his brother to make it more accountable, personal, active. Who is his brother? Well, Luke 10, the Samaritan, you know the story. Ignoring a need can be sin. Indifference to needs, one of the benefits of stewardship is the ability to meet the needs of others. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. In other words, talk's cheap is what John is saying. A brother or sister be naked, James tells us, and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? That's where that expression comes from. You hear people say, Be warmed and filled. They're being facetious, of course. They, want to, they really want you to do something. Three wonderful blessings. Assurance, answered prayer, and abiding wraps up this, book, this uh, chapter. Assurance. Hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. Of the truth. A Christian who practices love grows in his understanding of God's truth and enjoys a heart full of confidence before God. That's part of growth. You say you're not 100% grown yet. No surprise, none of us are. We're all growing, hopefully. Truth, when the word and the deed be... I love that definition of truth. I got it from my wife. Definition of truth. When the word and the deed become one. Sounds like an Indian should be saying it over a campfire, doesn't it, somehow? Yeah. When the Word and the deed... Become. But uh, see, the Word did... God's Word became incarnate and dwelt among us. Wow. The ultimate truth, of course, is Jesus Christ, the Word of God, one of His, one of his titles. For if our heart condemneth, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. At Bethany, Jesus knew Mary's heart and defended her in Luke 10. At Peter's denial, Jesus knew of his repentance and sent a special message to him in Mark 16. And Peter's confidence was essential on this very issue, of course, in Acts 3. Be careful that the devil not accuse you and rob you of your confidence. Your confidence is in a Savior. Never forget it. Answered prayer. Wow. 
Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things which are pleasing in His sight. And every time I think of answered prayer, which of course we should be grateful for, I'm also reminded that we should also be grateful for our unanswered prayers. Whenever you go to a high school reunion, you can be reminded of all the prayers that you're grateful that he didn't. <laughs> your love for the brethren proves that you are living in the will of God where he can answer your prayer. A believer's relationship to the brethren cannot be divorced from his prayer life. Think about that. A believer's relationship to the brethren cannot be divorced from his prayer life. How easy it is to overlook that, to let that be a victim to the when the urgent preempt the important. If husbands and wives are not obeying God's word, their prayers will be hindered, the Scripture tells us in a number of places. And finally, abiding, John's favorite word. And this is commandment that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. Love is the fulfilling of God's law, obviously, in Romans 13 and elsewhere. And he that keepeth this commandment dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us. How? By the Spirit which he hath given us. Now the Holy Spirit is here mentioned for the first time. It was introduced in 2.20, actually, initially, but here it's mentioned. And uh, we're going to find uh, he's abiding here, but he's going to be attesting in chapter 4, and he's going to be authenticating in chapter 5. So we're going to be hearing much more about him as we go forward. So in our next session, we're going to deal with false teachers. So does this epistle have relevance to us to today? You know, it's astonishing to me. Here we have this probably one of the most intimate of all the epistles, the family epistle as some people call it. And it's astonishing to realize how relevant it is for us today. So we're going to talk about false teachers very bluntly and candidly next time. So for in preparation next time, read 1 John chapter 4. And let's stand for a closing word of prayer. For a while there, you didn't think we'd make it, did you? So I saw some of you engineers doing linear extrapolations and, and, and convinced we weren't going to finish this chapter until a week from Wednesday. Yeah. Now we made it, sort of. Clumsily, perhaps, and obviously incompletely, our whole goal is to stimulate you to do your own digging. But th hopefully this will give you a springboard. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you loved us so much, even be before we loved you. You went to such extreme on our behalf. Father, we do pray that you would reignite in each of us a new passion, a new hunger for your word, and that you would Help each of us to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord. We pray, Father, that your purpose would be accomplished in each of us as we commit ourselves without any reservations whatsoever into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord, our Savior, our coming King. Amen.